Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. What is an influencer? Because Instagram is full of accounts that have a lot of followers and maybe even get a lot of engagement. But to me, you're not an influencer until you can actually influence somebody to buy something. Nobody needs to be influenced to buy Pappy, to buy Weller, to buy uh, a tailor. This is episode 302 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode on Instagram, influencers, and bourbon, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Well, speaking of Instagram, Dixon Dedman of Kentucky Owl announced on his Instagram account that batch 10 of Kentucky Owl bourbon and batch four of Kentucky Owl Rye will be the last batches that bear his name and signature on the label as he is moving away from the brand and from Stoli. In his Instagram video, he mentioned that he's not stepping away from the industry entirely as there's a few more projects that he has in the works. Well, best of luck to you, Dixon. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Bullet Whiskey has announced a new eco-friendly cocktail kit in celebration of Earth Month and Earth Day 2021 with plans to donate 22% of the kit sales during the month of April to American Forests, the oldest national nonprofit conservation organization in the United States. Made with sustainably sourced ingredients and packaged with compostable materials, the kit is available in both classic and mini sizes. It contains everything whiskey lovers need to craft an eco-friendly sip of paradise cocktail at home, including bullet bourbon, a pineapple cordial and citrus stock garnished with a dehydrated lemon wheel. The limited edition Bullet Frontier Whiskey Earth Day Cocktail Kit is available for purchase now on Cocktail Courier's website with a suggested retail price of $70 per kit. Bardstown Bourbon Company recently released its second collaboration with The Prisoner Wine Company. This new release is a 100 proof 10 year old Tennessee bourbon aged for 18 months in French oak red wine barrels. This new collaboration is available for a retail price of $124. Garrison Brothers is creating a new line of small batch bourbon friendly cigars in partnership with Payne Mason. It's one of the country's largest cigar manufacturers. The custom package of cigars includes one bourbon infused flagship cigar, along with three additional non infused cigars blended specifically to pair with characteristics of Garrison Brothers' four different bourbon expressions. The cigars will be sold online and at the Garrison Brothers Distillery in High, Texas. So what does it mean to be an influencer? Actually, what's the deal with bourbon and Instagram and why is it so popular? We're joined by Eric Kim of Scotch and Time and James Ashcraft, who owns the bourbon enthusiast handle, to analyze these questions and many more. It's great insight to see how social media and whiskey joins forces that gives hours of nonstop entertainment, but also maybe some annoyances arise when you're trying to create ways of engagement, and we also look at that as well. I also want to take a second to put out a friendly public service announcement to say that there has been an abundance of scammers on Instagram and Facebook recently. They even flood Bourbon Pursuits pages by commenting on old photos, telling folks they have bottles for sale. Just be careful out there. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. 
Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cask strength. And you can even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. Now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Clay Strong. Clay writes me on fredminnick.com. Uh, this is a long message, so bear with me. I'm a regular listener to Burn Pursuit Podcast. I've always enjoyed Above the Char. I have what I feel could be a good topic. I live in Indiana where the larger chains tend to get most of the allocations, single barrel picks, etc. However, this does not directly translate to excellent customer service, and often the opposite is true. I really hate going in these large chains because their salespeople get angry when you ask about anything other than the stuff they have on the shelves, and they are rarely educated on bourbon. I'm ready to spend good money for something that they are supposedly wanting to sell me, and yet it's such an imposition to them that I don't just want to walk out the door with a handle of Fireball. I have a great locally owned liquor store in the town where I work that works hard to find bottles for me and provides excellent customer service. Other than supporting them with sales, what are other ways we can help them get allocations? Um... Basically, what we're talking about here is we are talking about a small business taking on the Walmarts of the world and Amazons of the world. And while we are seeing this in the the liquor store world, imagine how independent booksellers felt in the 1990s uh, when Amazon came out. Imagine when how uh, candle shops felt when Hallmark and then everybody from Walmart to a grocery store started carrying uh, massive amounts of really awesome candles. You know, this is just unfortunately a, a story in American business. What makes liquor a lot different is that independent store owner actually can have power and can actually kind of corner like a little pocket of the market that the big chains don't focus on. And that customer service is a big, big part of it. So how can you help them? Well, I tell you what, if you know the distributors in town, call them. They actually do will listen to uh, uh, consumers about where they like to spend their money because at the end of the day, it's good for them as well. And they... You know, most distributors actually want to make sure that the independent stores are still going. You know why? They have better margins with independent operators. You know, the Walmarts, the Myers, the Targets, all these places, they nickel and dime those distributors down to where they're, you know, clean into the bone when it comes into the profit side. So, you know, call a distributor, tell them where you would like to see the allocated products go. and um You don't want to buy the case of Fireball at a chain store, but would you consider it at the independent store? That's a question I'm really asking because that helps them get that sweet pappy that everybody's always looking for. And that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, like Clay did here, make sure you hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And just click the contact form. And uh, let me know your idea. If I like it, I'll read it on the air and answer it to the best of my ability. But that's going to do it for this week, folks. Be safe out there. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here today talking about something that is relatively kind of, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's definitely the rise of what we see in social media and things that are trending just in the bourbon world. I know for the longest time, you know, Fred's not here today and it would have been a good time to rib on him because, you know, we're always, you know, there are the authors and the magazine writers of the world. And as Ryan used to like to say, the the people who pound away on typewriters, but now we have a, a new rise to fame and that's what we see inside of social media. And today we're joined by two people that are very, very heavily influential inside of the Instagram space. And it's going to be a fun conversation because we see a lot of different ways that people 
take Instagram. I mean, you've got people that are really into it, like really into whiskey, really do it. And they use that as a platform to kind of talk about what they're into and how to talk about more of the explosion and what they love about bourbon. There's also people that just love trying to hunt rare bottles and just show all kinds of closed bottles on their Instagram page to gain followers. Uh, and then there's also a lot of, uh, I guess you could say like people that are trying to dupe people out of their money and a lot of try to theft that happens inside that world too. So it'll be a, it'll be a fun conversation. That was a very long winded way to say hello, Ryan, but, uh, yeah. He'll, hello, Kenny. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree and concur with all that. Uh, it, it is funny that traditional media and, you know, the distilleries too, you know, they, they're, they're still stuck somewhat in the old media type, you know, print, you know, billboards, some digital TV, you know, and it's like where most of the eyes are really on these social channels. And I think they're really starting to take it seriously. And it's, I think it's taken like new people like Barstown Bourbon Company and a, a few of the new distilleries to kind of, that are taking advantage of that and know that the value that there is because with social media, you know, it's, it's not just like an ad or a paper or whatever you trust, you follow these people and you start to trust them and, you know, really give in to like what they like and you know they're they're not trying to fool you they're just somebody that is you and they're kind of giving you a path to show you the way in the the whatever market that may be but for in this case bourbon yeah i totally agree there's a lot of companies that are starting to see this this new influencer side start growing up and and i will talk about just the word influencer at some point as well because i know some people that are in this world they don't like the word but it you know it, it just is what it is so today let's go ahead and introduce our guest so today on the show we have eric kim he runs the account called scotch and time and we have james ashcraft and he runs the bourbon enthusiast guys welcome to the show thanks for having me. how are you yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So one of the things that we like to do when we start off our new shows here, and I kind of didn't give you a warm up here, but we love to have a uh, like random icebreaker to kind of just let people know more about you. So I'm going to go, James, you first. Are you more of a thrill seeker or would you rather relax? Oh, I'm relaxing on a beach somewhere. That is, uh, that's my vibe. Yeah. No, no skydiving for me. <laughs> Eric, what about you? Oh, I'm 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 pretty much uh, a big thrill seeker. I've uh, random. Uh, I've uh, skydived. I've bungee jumped in five different countries. I pretty much, uh, and I'm a diehard snowboarder. That's actually my passion more than uh, even whiskey or watches. So uh, yeah, I, I love the thrill. I'm getting old. It hurts now, but uh, yeah, I'm still a thr thrill seeker. I believe. So good contrast here. <laughs> yes. What about you, Ryan? Are you more of a, a beach vibe or are you bungee jumping? So, you know, the funny thing is like when I'm busy, I'm like, gosh, all I want to do is relax and chill out. And then I'll sit there and relax and chill out. I'm like, God, all I want to do is do something. <laughs> you know, it's like no matter what I'm doing, I'm never content. But uh, I think that's the ADHD uh, brain I have. But uh, yeah, I, I don't necessarily skydive or jump planes, but uh, it's hard for me to like just marinate on the beach or in a chair. Uh, so if I'm on a beach, I'm probably usually like paddle boarding or boogie boarding or doing something active. Uh, I just can't sit still. Yeah, I've got I've got about like 24 hours of like beach vibe in me. And it's one of those things that, you know, you go and, you know, for us in the Midwest here ish, you know, if you travel to Florida or California or whatever, you, you go to a beach and you rent out a house out there for a week we have about maybe like two or three days of like unrest. Like we go to the beach, we come back, go to the beach, come back. And you're like, okay, we got to break this up. We got to do something. And whether it's go-karts or whether it's, uh, you know, riding a jet ski or just something to just Yeah, break that's it where up. the boating, the boating aspect yeah. comes in handy. Because yeah, there's only so long you can sit on a beach. Yeah, for sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah, fishing's great. <laughs> so, so guys, I kind of want to uh, kind of first kind of kick this off and, and hand it over to you. And James, I'll kind of go first you know, talk about when you got into doing the bourbon enthusiast and how, you know, your handle or your account really started gaining a lot of traction and how people started really either taking you seriously, or maybe, maybe we're not taking everybody seriously anymore. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Um, you know, I really started the bourbon enthusiast as an outlet to just, um, 
it's funny because my my wife's family who follows my private, you know, social media, they don't drink alcohol. And so I really needed an outlet to kind of post, you know, kind of, you know, what was becoming my passion. And I was just researching one day and, you know, saw that the bourbon enthusiast handle was open. So I took it. And uh, I think that very night I started with, uh, you know, uh, I think an old fashioned or something that I made. Um, and that's how the account really started is just like an outlet to uh, kind of post, uh, you know, all about the bourbon. I had been kind of reviewing for about, I don't know, two years, just, you know, in my tasting journals. I think this is back in 2015. And really just uh, just a place to kind of start sharing that. And then once it, uh, once it started, I think at the end of 2015, early 2016. Yeah, I think the response was was a little better than I anticipated. And I think by, you know, three, four months into it, I think I got my first samples sent from a distillery, which I think was Old Forester at the time. And at that point, I started taking a little more seriously, you know, seriously, and um, really started putting my thoughts, a little more composed captions on there, talking about the products. And then um, it really kind of got on the media list from there on out. And I think each year... You know, it's just gotten crazier and crazier with the brands catching on um, to the, I guess, the influence and power of social media has. And really, like last year, I was getting close to five bottles a week, you know, from from different brands and stuff. And that's kind of what it's kind of got up to now. So, yeah, that was kind of the start. And that's how it all started. And it's just uh, it's been crazy ever since. That's fantastic. Hiding from your in-laws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, well, now they all know. Now right. they're all OK with it. So I guess it was a. Uh, I could have been doing it there's, all along. There's no more organic story than that. I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, same question to you. And if you remember the first time you got your media sample, your first media sample. I, I think my journey uh, is different than most Instagrammers. So um, I used to be a big watch guy, hence the scotch and time. Uh, so uh, I was always involved with uh, luxury from one standpoint. I started off as a wine collector and my wines were getting bad because, uh, you know, a lot of wines after 10 years, uh, they kind of hit their prime. And I'd been drinking a little bit of a typical Asian. I had McAllen and Johnny Walker Blue in my, in my house. Uh, I worked a lot. So um, I think what happened was uh, I actually owned a Swiss, Swiss watch boutique for a couple of years. So I was, wor- I was putting in 100 hour weeks with my government job and with my uh, full time job in watches. So out of boredom, I got on Instagram, started posting a- and putting uh, rare timepieces on bottles. And kind of I think I'm kind of responsible. Uh, I, I apologize for it for all these guys who started putting watches on their bottles. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. But now I see it everywhere. Uh, so Every Sunday was the only day I actually didn't work double shifts. So they kept inviting me to events and I couldn't go because I was always working. So I decided, hey, I'm going to create my own event. I'm going to invite some people. It's going to be on a Sunday that I can do it. And so it'll be on my schedule. And uh, I hosted my first event um, at the Trump International. Uh, They had a McAllen room and uh, I invited all the D.C. Instagrammers per se uh, we all got drunk and we were all very happy and <laughs> kind of uh, launched the Scotch and Time series. So uh, you mentioned that term, inst- um, I, I guess, influencer. And I guess if I have to define myself, what I do is I'm sort of the influencer's influencer. So um, what I primarily do, uh, rather than talk about uh, tasting notes, is I search all over Instagram to find accounts that I think are legitimate are passionate and um, and have a, a, a similar thought process and try to find them and bring them together for unique uh, whiskey events that are supported by the brand. So it just kind of grew, started small and then kind of went really big. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I wanted to do something that was uh, bourbon focused and kind of got to where I'm at, at now. That's real cool. And, and I want to also say that, you know, we share a little bit of the same passion, like I remember when I bought my first sort of like high-end luxury watch, it took me probably about a year and a half of just like studying and understanding like everything that goes into luxury. 
I know we we call them time pieces sometimes, and some people are like, oh, that's oh, like cringeworthy. Like, vomit. That's a, yeah, see, some people like that. And, and <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. There's there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, you can just look at your phone and see your see the time. Or like, I wear an Apple Watch. I'm just like, no, you just don't get it. Like, you don't understand the craftsmanship and how this functions without a battery. I mean, it's like a truly like engineering marvel. But we could go on about that another time. <laughs> we can let you all two just talk. You know, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could definitely geek out about watches. So uh, I'll, I'll give you plenty of stories later on offline. So yeah, I'm just a Fitbit guy, so I'm I'm lame in your all's world. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Me and James will talk. Yeah, there you go. So I'll throw I'll throw another one at you. So there's um we we kind of see a lot of differences. We see different postings inside of Instagram and people are starting to branch out to other sort of forms and mediums. But Instagram seems to be the one that a lot of brands are really latching onto now. Have you all seen, let's see, maybe like, do you remember like either was a a, a day or, or sorry, not a day, but maybe a particular year, or maybe it's just now starting that you see more brands starting to hop on this sort of, we got to get these people that are doing sort of like nice pictures and doing Instagram. I mean, that you got like Nate with whiskey with a view and like everybody takes a little bit of a different approach to all this versus the standard bloggers or the standard people that would just write for, you know, whiskey advocate or whatever, where they send them a bottle, but they're not going to either put out a review or even if they do put on their blog, it only gets a couple hundred hits versus somebody that's got, you know, for you all, that's got, you know, 50 to 150,000 followers, they're going to get tens of thousands of views. Yeah, I think it's just gotten progressively, you know, uh, just more and more over the years. I think last year kind of blew me away with the amount of brands reaching out to me in particular, um, you know, or or their marketing agencies or their P- whoever does their PR. And a, and a lot of those PR, like once you're in with one, sometimes they represent like 10 different whiskey companies. Um, and then all of a sudden you're getting samples from, you know, everybody that's kind of in their portfolio. But yeah, I think I think brands really now are catching on to the power of social media. They really, they really see it as a, you know, a place to really showcase anything that they have coming out and really blast it out directly to their target audience, which, you know, obviously us doing it for a while, we've kind of realized that, but, you know, now the brands are really kind of catching up with the times. Eric, have you seen some sort of like, yeah, that, that inflection point, if you will? It's actually funny. I think for Scotch whiskey, it's actually a little bit on the downtrend, and for bourbon, it's uh, it's actually grown. Uh, so I think the bigger brands, uh, especially with the Scotch brands, they have uh, I think bigger budgets, and there are more. I, I guess there are more groups that work together on the Scotch side, whereas bourbon is a little bit more. Uh, even with like Buffalo Trace, there's I think each brand kind of represents itself uh, in, in in their little niche. So, yeah, I think with bourbon brands, they're finally starting to to see the benefits. And I kind of tell people that Instagram is not actually the best uh, way to sell whiskey. It is the fastest and least expensive way to uh, spread the word about up and coming whiskey. So uh, a lot, you know, I I worked with Woodenville and I worked with Wilderness Trail. And I think uh, over the past couple of years, they've gotten a lot of uh, inexpensive exposure uh, because of uh, events and the people that I'm connected with. So uh, it's very effective. But like you said, there are a lot of uh, questionable Instagram accounts. And um, I'm, I'm glad we're going to discuss that a little mm-hmm. later because uh, I'm very happy to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely do that. And I, I love what you brought up about the the kind of like the price point to impression ratio. I think you do get a lot of bang for your buck because sometimes, I mean, and we do the same exact thing or we're, we're right along there with you. We all get samples sent to us. We do whiskey quickies, but we also post stuff. You know, sometimes we'll post something on Instagram, but most of the time we save it for our, our podcast, be able to do it. But for you all, I mean, what's it take for a company to send out a sample kit? Maybe it's like five to $10 in packaging and the whiskey, and then maybe another $10 in the label. They send it. So let's say, let's say all in at the most, it's $30 and they send it to one of you all they get an Instagram post and they've got 30,000 views on it. Like it's a, it's a pretty good return on investment. Yeah. And you got a highly engaged audience that's wanting to follow these people, wanting to see and pictures speak a thousand words, you know, and it's when it's not from a distillery, you know, and it's from one of your peers, you kind of trust that more. You know, it's, it's the easiest thing for the brands to do. I mean, 
you think about how much money they spend on advertising in other places, trying to do Facebook ads or other ads. And I mean, the easiest thing for them to do, you're absolutely right, is spend 15 bucks on shipping to people on social media that has the, their target audience, you know? I think it's just incredibly easy thing for them to do and, um, you know, very cheaply too. Yeah. So one of the things that I want to talk about here, because Ryan, you, you brought up a thing about like engagement, because engagement is actually very important. And we have to see like what posts get sort of engagement. And for me, there are some that I find so cringeworthy on Instagram. It's when you see things like Weller Wednesday or Shelfie Sunday or <laughs> Frugal Friday, like I'm and people eat it up and I don't get it. Like, why do people love that stuff? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same reason they like Taco Tuesday or yeah. <laughs> the the motivation thing, you know, you see the ones that say motivation and, you know, and it's like 8 a.m. when they're posting, you know, and it's like the start of your, your work week. I don't know how many people are going to relate to that, but, um, you know, when they act like they just took a picture of the whiskey just now, when you, you could tell it's a photo they've had for a while, acting like they're having it at 8 a.m. that morning. Yeah, I don't get the I don't get the point in I don't get the point in that. <laughs> I, I totally agree. So do you all have like, because I, I dabble in the Instagram with, I'll pop in there. I tell Kenny, I post and ghost, uh, <laughs> from time to time, but Kenny does most of our social media. Do y'all, I guess to, do y'all have like some kind of cadence that you, you know, set up for yourselves to like be consistent and then like to what are your like go-tos that you know are just going to get more engagement versus others, you know, other posts? Yeah. I try to always post you know, around 8, 8 p.m. That's kind of whenever I like to post. And I feel like, you know, people can kind of see the post as they're kind of laying in bed later on. And that's really around the time I'm drinking whiskey, too. So <laughs> um, it makes sense. So, I'll, you know, a lot of times I do do actual, you know, my photos or whatever I'm reviewing that time. I'll do them then. And then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll post about it that night. But yeah, it is interesting to kind of look at the insights. And Eric, you might see this, too, of what what brands do particularly well really what's surprising for me is when I'm looking at the insights, like Woodford Reserve does better than any of my posts. Some like crazy well, um, Interesting. which, which I found surprising and I'm watching Buffalo Trace kind of go down in terms of, uh, the interaction. That's surprising. Cause usually Buffalo yeah. Trace is the Weller Wednesday, yeah, right. whatever it's going to be. If yeah. I, if I, if I'm down in the dumps and I want to get a few likes, I'll post a bottle of stag or something. I know it's <laughs> right. going to give me something. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm kidding, but <laughs> Eric, what's your take on it? No, I, I think, uh, it's probably the best uh, bang for the buck on a post is actually not bourbon. It's uh, Johnny Walker. A bottle of Johnny Walker blue goes miles and miles and miles. So, um, uh, I think I, I think what it is, is I don't follow any particular algorithm when it's slow, when it's busy. I just do my thing. I used to post a couple times a day and it would just be whatever I was in the mood for. In fact, um, I have a lot of mini bottles and I'm not a mini bottle collector. Some of those guys are fanatical, uh, but I had a lot of mini bottles because I could stick it in my backpack. And anytime I see uh, a nice uh, whiskey with a view type uh, type shot, I just pop a mini bottle out and take a picture with the background and, and it gets a light. So I, I think a lot of it is understanding your audience and uh, hopefully having the right types of followers. So uh, originally, yes, certain brands did much better than others. But once your audience gets used to uh, you introducing a, a, a new whiskey that they know that is good because you've tried it and, and you're backing it, uh, they started looking at my account to find out uh, new and trending bourbons. And so these lesser known bottles were getting a lot more likes than I expected. Originally, it was like you get a thousand on one and you post an unknown bottle and you get a hundred likes and you're dying because there's no engagement. And then as I kept going along, the engagement got better and better because more people were expecting and looking for me to, to uh, point them a new direction. So I think now um, there's still brands that do better, but overall on average, I think... Um, I think the numbers have become a little bit more consistent. Yeah. And this is another kind of thing that you had talked about there of, of it being so easy to just pull out a bottle and, and grab a shot. And that is, this is really a, a low barrier to entry kind of market that a lot of people get into. And, and now that Ryan and I, we kind of have our, our own thing going on with our own spirits company, I get messages on there from people with like 500 followers and they're like, Hey, we do whiskey reviews on Instagram. Make sure you send us media samples. I'm like, 
like I, I'm not new to this, right? I know 500, it's not enough yet. So have you all seen like the, a huge influx of people that are also trying to come into this market? And do you feel that there's enough room for everybody or that right now, like we've, you've kind of got your top dogs in, in what's happening in the IG world? I certainly get hit up by a lot of, um, you know, new accounts. I, there's no way I can get to, you know, all the messages I get, but I, I do I do try to read a lot of them and get back to the ones I can. But there are a lot of like startup accounts that reach out just wondering how you get on the level. How do you get media samples? You know, what it takes to kind of grow their following. And then you see a lot of people just doing strange things like with uh, trying to post like random objects with a bourbon and that's what their account is. And it's like, you know, we're trying to engage a different <laughs> hobby in the bourbon. And then those accounts just never make it past, you know, 50 followers. But um yeah. Get your rock, t- rock tumbler and a whiskey. Yeah, yeah. yeah or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. What kind of time investment do you guys have? You know, you talk about replying to comments and posting and all. what kind of time commitment do you see like every day to kind of help sustain this, you know, following? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53-gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more, where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep or a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery has been lifting America's spirit since 1935. They celebrate American whiskey's rich traditions, guide its evolution, and champion its exciting future. For Heaven Hill, whiskey is more than a profession. It's a personal passion that is poured into every bottle, shared with newcomers and aficionados alike. So whether you enjoy the simple pleasure of Evan Williams' bottle and bond, or savor that uniquely satisfying experience of a rare single barrel bourbon like Elijah Craig 18-year-old, you'll find a home at Heaven Hill. If you want to learn more about the craft and techniques of making quality American whiskey, check out the educational resources and sign up for their newsletter at heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely and drink wisely. Cheers. What kind of time investment do you guys have? You know, you talk about replying to comments and posting and what kind of time commitment do you see like every day to kind of help sustain this, you know, following? Yeah, for, for me, um, you know, I, I give it as much time as I can. You know, I certainly don't let it take away from any type of family time or anything like that. But, you know, typically uh, really just laying in bed is the, is the only time I've got to uh, kind of go through and answer answer what I can. And, and you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, cherry pick the, the ones that I think are legitimate and really seeking guidance. And, you know, uh, and then there's a, there, I get and you guys probably do, too, but the you know, I get pictures of people just in liquor stores, you know, what should I buy? You know, this, and then there's no way I could get to all those. There's no way. And by the time I do that, they're, they're long gone. What about you, Eric? How much time are you, you putting into this? I, I don't pay attention at all. So. <laughs> it's the best <laughs> way to do it. It's, it's like trying to keep track of all the bottles you buy. It's just best not to know. Yeah. I, 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 I don't consider it uh, a business. I mean, I do make money on it. Um, I do have quite a few, uh, uh, sponsors, but I don't put a pattern to how often I post for a sponsor uh, because my sponsorship has to do with them supporting my events. So I don't actually accept any sponsorship of of posting bottles for them because I'm trying to sell something for them. 
Uh, obviously, you know, uh, if you look at like Mark and Cherry Carter, uh, we're, we're like family. So, you know, I, I let people know we're, we're really close. I don't want to hide that fact. I love their whiskey, but we are beyond uh, brand and, uh, you know, influencer relationship. We hang out all the time. Um, so I really never thought of this as a potential business. So everything that I put into it, I, and so, sometimes uh, up until COVID started, I put a lot of time into Instagram. I mean, I looked, I looked at the uh, amount of times I spent on Instagram and it was pretty bad. So, <laughs> but, you know, again, I enjoyed it. So I never counted it. They're like, how long does it take you? I, I was a master of five minute posts. I would just take a picture. I'd post some random comment and let it go. And I didn't care about you know, I care about the quality, but I wasn't going to be anal like some people are about the perfect shot. So, yeah, I I never thought of it that way. And I think uh, I think that's kind of why I, my following grew organically. I, I never paid attention to any of those gimmicks. I never paid attention to the algorithm uh, because my account kept growing. So I, I don't care if the algorithm is good or bad as long as my account's growing. Speaking of organic, that's a good way to bring up what do you all think of people that pay for followers? You see it a lot, actually, because, you you know, you see these accounts with over 100,000 followers and then nobody likes their posts, nobody comments, um, you know, and there, there's there's a bunch of them out there. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm not for it. And I don't even know if it's really doing them any good. You know, I think somebody just conned them and I think they eventually, you know, end up losing those followers um, over time. But yeah, yeah, not, I don't I don't get that. Yeah, yeah we see we see it a lot. No, that's. Uh, yeah, it's it's a pet peeve, uh, again, because I, I look for specifically to find the right types of people to invite to my events. Uh, my events are, are at no cost, but they're invite only. Uh, there is no ticketed or public aspect to them. So I, I try to search and speak with as many, uh, I guess, influential accounts as I can. And yeah, uh, people that buy followers, I think people are smart enough to know who Definitely. those people are. Uh, people who are gimmicky, who, who like you said, post the same damn whiskey wall with the same damn closed bottles nonstop. But there are a lot of people that follow them, follow them. And I think we could let it bother us to some guy who doesn't, who I don't even know drinks whiskey has 65,000 followers because all he does is post Pappy and Weller all day or post somebody else's Shelvies all the time and gets likes because of other people's pictures. You know, I, I think there's a space on Instagram for anything. And if all you want to do is post uh, bottles of overpriced bottles at liquor stores or cheap ones, um, you know, it's your Instagram. You can do what you want. But when you start to get money or get benefits from it and it's not natural, it 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 bugs me. You just brought up like two cringe, more more cringe things. I think there's a lot there's a lot of cringe stuff that happens in this world. I just realized. So, uh, you know, you had just mentioned posting pictures of sealed bottles. When you see a bunch of sealed bottles and it's the same seal, as you said, as you mentioned, we know these accounts and it's the same bottles over and over and over and over again, because they're just looking for that kind of false engagement or I don't know what it is, but that's just one thing that really just grinds my gears. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I, I don't even, I don't pay too much attention, but obviously, you know, Instagram's going to throw that stuff in front of you you know, whenever you have a bourbon based account. So, you know, you see enough of it, but yeah, close bottles. And then they're asking, which one are you reaching for? That's the same caption every single time. <laughs> there you go. The false engagement. Yeah. There's okay. There's cringe number three. When people are like left or right. Yeah. It, it's same <laughs> Oh my same God. Thing. It kills me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, and, and, and it works, but I think, um, uh, one of the thing that things that bother me about uh, those types of posts or posts at liquor stores about pricing, whether it's high or low, I, I think they give their audience only part of the picture because a lot of liquor stores, I mean, how many bottles of Tito's vodka do you have to buy for every couple of bottles of Pappy that you get? So you can criticize, you know, it's not like a total wine where you're buying uh, crates and crates and crates. You know, these some of these smaller liquor stores have to make a a pretty substantial uh, financial investment in product that they can't sell in order to get a few allocated bottles. So to criticize and call out a bottle, uh, you know, a store for for overpricing uh, a bottle, you just don't have to buy it. I, I won't post it. You know, I look at it, and if I see the price is too high, I just don't buy it. I'm not. I'm not gonna uh, judge a store because they are they are pricing uh, their bottles 
a certain way, unless all of their bottles across the board are expensive. If it's reasonably priced and it's only certain bottles that are priced up, I understand it's it's a three it's a three tier system, you know. So uh, that's a struggle, and to um, to affect a business, you know, it's it's the same thing. I don't give a lot of bad reviews, so if somebody sends me a bottle and I don't like it, I just don't post it uh, because. When I had my event uh, last year, Bourbon and Time, I wanted the Instagram audience to understand. So these influencers, I took them to the Brown Foreman Cooperage and let them see in 108, 110 degree weather, these eight hour shifts where people were in fire making these stays and all the effort that goes into uh, making a whiskey before a single drop goes into a barrel. Um, it, it's somebody likes that whiskey or else that whiskey wouldn't exist. So for me as an influencer to criticize something that I didn't like harshly, uh, I think it doesn't help the market. You know, it's not my, you know, or at least say it's not my preference, but there are certainly people that will like it. And that was co-sponsored by Cooper's Craft. So it really opened up a lot of Instagrammers eyes that, hey, maybe I shouldn't trash talk a brand when they can see how many jobs and and how many different industries are involved in it, whether it's bottling or or anything else, labels. You know, there's a lot that goes into the economy, uh, especially the economy in Kentucky, uh, be- before you make a whiskey. So you need to think twice before you make any criticisms. That's just my personal feeling. It's funny. I had the same epiphany when I went to the, when Kenny and I went to the Cooperage and you see these guys sweating, bending, you know, doing all these this really hard and labor intensive work. I was like, man, I will never say a bottle sucks yeah. on air again. You know, it's just because they're, they are working so hard and there's so many moving facets to get it to that bottle. Well, and, that, and to that too, you know, whenever you get like a new or, you know, from the smaller craft distilleries, you know, I try not to post anything harsh or negative. Um, you know, I will tell a whiskey, you know, uh, if, if I love it, you're going to know, you know, it's going to, it's going to say it there on the post. Um, I certainly won't bad mouth a brand or, you know, really break, like say this is God awful. This is terrible. People put a lot of time and they think it's good. They, you know, making a whiskey is not easy. And, you know, you never know how it's going to turn out whenever they go to release it. Um, and so people, people put a lot of time and effort into it. So I'm, I'm very conscious not to, uh, rip them down. But, you know, when I do see, you know, there are little things that I will like, for example, um, what's the New York, uh, Hudson whiskey. They kind of came in the craziest, you know, media kit oh, yeah. I've ever seen. It was huge. Everything. Like a Saks Fifth Avenue you package. Know, yeah. yeah. I mean, that thing was like 500 bucks probably to put together. Um, and then, you know, the whiskey's just, um, it, it's not for me, you know, and it's like uh, the rye whiskey was the earthiest, grassiest thing I've ever tasted. And so when I do my post, I don't, I don't say it's the worst whiskey I've ever had, but, you know, I just want to say that, you know, it's not, uh, it's not for me. It's not my profile, but if you like earth and you like, uh, you know, kind of the earthy notes, might be worth a try, but you know, I, I definitely don't want to bad mouth anybody's hard work. And yeah, it's, it's hard. You gotta, we, we have this internal struggle as moral quandary as well. It's like, you want to review these products to give them like honest feedback, but you know, like the honest feedback is not going to be beneficial to them. And so it's right. like, how do you tell them like, okay, it's not ready yet. Like there's promising stuff there, but you know, as it is right now, it's not ready. But then that says to our audience, you know, well, I'm not going to buy that. So it's like a, you want to, you know, and you don't want everything to be positive because then they're like, oh, they just like everything because exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's hard finding that balance as a, a reviewer to give the audience what they want and the brands what they want. And that I do love it when brands, they actually reach out to me and ask me like, well, what did you, what did you really think? Or what was your honest assessment of the whiskey? Just please lay it on it. And I love it. But that's, I, that's probably happened two out of a hundred times, you know, <laughs> right. that, that they've done. Um, but I love it when they do that and I give them, you know, the honest feedback, you know, if, if all I get is grain and youth, you know, that is, you know, a lot of people are going to knock it for that. Yeah. And I think, by the way, I love this discussion. I love what you all are saying because it's very honest uh, about what we should see and what people probably should abide by. And the other thing I want to also bring up is, you know, you're looking at the craft side. If you're giving somebody a craft whiskey that's two, three, four years old and you put out a bad review that lives on the internet forever. Yep. And once that whiskey turns five, six, seven, eight, it's going to change. It's going to be a lot different. But that whiskey review 
is going to be out there and it's going to turn off more people because at that point it's been out for so long, it's got higher SEO rankings and that's what people are going to see. And so you're going to actually do more damage to brands in the long term. Yeah. Kenny, Kenny, you brought up a good top, uh, a good comment about people don't like the term influencer. Uh, but I, I think we need to break it down. What is an influencer? Because Instagram is full of accounts that have a lot of followers and maybe even get a lot of engagement. But to me, you're not an influencer until you can actually influence somebody to buy something. Nobody needs to be influenced to buy Pappy, to buy Weller, to buy uh, a tailor, right? They, they're going to buy it no matter what. It's going to sell no matter what. So an influencer is, can you get somebody to buy a bourbon that nobody's ever heard of because they actually appreciate your palate? They appreciate your judgment. To me, that's when you're an influencer, when you can actually move the curve and get people to, uh, to get out of their comfort zone and try something different. Yeah. And I think that word influencer, you know, just has a lot of dirty context with it. They don't, they don't realize the people behind the influencers, like, you know, you two and us two, uh, we're, we're very passionate people. We put a lot of time and effort into this. It's, it is an art and it is a, a, a craft, you know, and we want others to enjoy it with us. And I think that's why people trust us is because that it comes from a genuine place. It's not just we're here to monetize. I think that was a great explanation, uh, Eric, about, you know, an influencer because they're trusted by people in this community. It's not just somebody out there trying to get likes and be like, look at me, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I think we touched on a lot of great topics today. We hit a, a lot of cringe things. Uh, we hit on some of the good things. We've, we've broken down the word of influencer. Uh, I kind of want to like wind this down talking about like one more good thing. Let's talk about one more good thing that comes out of this. You know, Eric, like you have putting a, a lot of effort into building the bourbon and time events and, and everything like that. What other kind of good things do you really start seeing that are being built out of the, the Instagram community? You know, I can only speak to uh, myself and, uh, and one of the things that bourbon and time has allowed me to do is really get to know the people. Um, you know, when you, when you can go to Kentucky and you have these Hall of Famers that you're having breakfast with and you're chilling out with, you know, I don't post about that stuff. I don't think that that, that, that is not what I want to do is show off who I know, uh, who I'm connected with. It's, it's, you know, for every bourbon and time, I'm in Kentucky 10 times to plan. And sometimes it's not even really planning. It's just an excuse to get to Kentucky and drink with my friends. So, um, you know, it, it is just amazing. Uh, every time I go, when you meet the people and you see the passion and you you just get to uh, get to really see the inside uh, kind of unfiltered without a shield of tr somebody trying to represent something. So, you know, you have friends that'll tell you if something's bad. You know, I uh, when I did my picks, I always bring bottles to the uh, to the top bar bartenders in Louisville and let them let them try it and give give me their feedback because I you know I want to know is my palate good or are people just telling me what I want to hear and then I turn around and nobody buys my bottle because it sucks you know <laughs> but uh, uh, but you know it 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 to me more than scotch you know because I'm big into all whiskeys and I'm into cognacs but uh, bourbon is more of a community it took me a while for people to accept me because they didn't know what to make of this not only Instagrammer, but Scotch guy uh, into who, who's who's trying to do a bourbon event in Kentucky. Outsider. Uh, once they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, once they realized, you know, that I bring two cases of uh, of whiskey and Scotch with me to share every time I go, and 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 we're just friends, and I just have a passion for whiskey. You know, I got to meet amazing people, and I feel really uh, part of the uh, the community. So if if Instagram dies. I've still made those friends. I've still made those relationships. And it's not because of my account. It's because uh, we are one community that have that has a shared interest. So I, I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, screw Instagram. I mean, it's it's it has allowed me to do things that I probably wouldn't have done without Instagram. And that's the biggest benefit to Instagram for me. So I'm really grateful for for that. And I got to meet you guys through it. So it's not all bad, uh, but there are plenty of bad. So all we can do is be good ambassadors and uh, uh, show people what we should be doing rather than what we are doing sometimes. I love it. That's a great explanation. Yes. And and 
James, I'll hand it over to you to, to kind of close this one out, but I'm also going to put one more on you because if somebody wants to go and create the, the Instagram handle, the bourbon enthusiast underscore, and they want just as many followers, what's the, what's the, <laughs> what's the path to take that success? Oh, well, don't do that first of all. <laughs> Think of something else. Go with Bourbon Pursuit too. Um, Love it's it. available, I check. Um, you know, it's it's really just coming from a place of passion. You know, putting putting out authentic reviews, um, you know, trying to put out good content. And I'll just kind of say that, you know, for me, you know, what Instagram's been able to do is just unbelievable. But, um, you know, through Instagram kind of started the Private Barrel Club, you know, which you guys have one as well, you know, but being able to, you know, it's not lost on me what I get to do, you know, uh, a, a dream of mine was always to select my own barrels. And the fact that I was able to do like 44 last year is just unbelievable. And what's so great about it is I get to take these people that have found me on Instagram, take as many as I can that the distillery will allow and go on these experiences that nobody really gets to do. And, you know, it's not lost on me, you know, what, what I'm, what I get to do. And I encourage everybody to, you know, that comes with me to take as much video and photos as possible. And then we all share it afterwards. And it's, you know, a lifetime of memories. That's really the great thing for me is just being able to go to Kentucky whenever there's not COVID, you know, almost once a month to select barrels normally. And, you know, being able to take, you know, a core group of people um, that share the same passion and just kind of live through their eyes each time of, you know, just what, what you get to do walking through ancient Rick houses with the master distiller, tasting through as many barrels as you want. There's no experience like that. So um, it's really, it's really amazing what, what, what's all come of this. We can echo that statement. Yeah. yeah probably a hundred times. That's the most rewarding part is meeting all these people that, like you said, barrel picks are, one of my friends did one yesterday and uh, I was like, how was he? He was like, oh my gosh, it was the most amazing experience. Like I can never replicate it. And I was like, I know I've done a ton of them. And every time I go, it's just as magical. I never take it for granted. You're meeting new people. You're, you just have that bond. You can almost remember like every barrel pick and what happened that day. It's a, uh, it is cool. For sure. That was a great way to close it out. Like I said, we, we hit a lot of great topics today. So make sure you follow these guys, the Bourbon Enthusiast and Scotch and Time on Instagram. I'm sure you could just hit that search bar button up there and they'll be number one and number uh, number one result again. So <laughs> make sure you, you follow along with them and make sure you check out the reviews. Hit up Eric for all your watch questions. I'm sure he loves that passion as well. They're, so. they're time pieces. Sorry, right. they're, sorry, they are time pieces. They are time pieces. <laughs> well, guys, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. So make sure you follow them. Follow Bourbon Pursuit on all the socials as well. And make sure you subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. Cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>